kick it in. My jaw hurts a little bit. And I think it's... Because I think I clenched my jaw when I'm asleep. Thank you so much to those of you who have checked it out. I really appreciate it. And um, we will be actually reading now. Okay, because I'm almost seven. It's almost there, but this dress needs to seal the deal. You guys have no idea how much I sing in my daily life. Chapter 7, Nightmare I told Charlie I had a lot of homework to do and that I didn't want anything to eat. There was a basketball game on that he was excited about, though of course I had no idea what was special about it, so he wasn't aware of anything unusual in my face or tone. Once in my room, I locked the door. I dug through my desk until I found my old headphones and I plugged them into my little CD player. I picked up a CD that Phil had given to me for Christmas. It was one of his favorite brands, but they used a little too much bass and shrieking for my taste. I popped it into place and lay down on my bed. I put on the headphones, hit play, and turned up the volume until I hurt my ears. I closed my eyes, but the light still intruded, so I added a pillow over the top, of, over the top half of my face. I concentrated very carefully on the music, trying to understand the lyrics to unravel the complicated drum patterns. By the third time I'd listened through the CD, I knew all the words to the choruses, at least. I was surprised to find that I really did like the band after all, once I got past the blaring noise. I'd have to think Phil again. And it worked. The shattering beats made it impossible for me to think, which was the whole purpose of this exercise. I listened to the CD again and again until I was singing along with all the songs until, finally, I fell asleep. I opened my eyes to a familiar place, aware in some corner of my consciousness that I was dreaming. I recognized the green light of the forest. I could hear the waves crashing against the rocks somewhere nearby, and I knew that if I found the ocean, I'd be able to see the sun. I was trying to follow the sound, but then Jacob Black was there, tugging on my hand, pulling me back toward the blackest part of the forest. Jacob, what's wrong? I asked. His face was frightened as he yanked with all his strength against my resistance. I didn't want to go into the dark. Run, Bella! You have to run! He whispered, terrified. This way, Bella! I recognized Mike's voice calling out of the gloomy heart of the trees, but I couldn't see him. Why? I asked, still pulling against Jacob's grasp, desperate now to find the sun. But Jacob let go of my hand and yelped, suddenly shaking, falling to the dim forest floor. He twitched on the ground as I watched in horror. Jacob! I screamed, but he was gone. In his place was a large red-brown wolf with black eyes. The wolf faced away from me, pointing toward the shore. There the hair on the back of his shoulders bristling, low growls issuing from between his exposed fangs. Bella, run! I cried out again from behind me, but I didn't turn. I was watching a light coming toward me from the beach. And then Edward stepped out from the trees, his skin faintly glowing, 
his eyes black and dangerous. He held up one hand and beckoned me to come to him. The wolf growled at my feet. I took a step forward toward Edward. He smiled then, and his teeth were sharp, pointed. Trust me, he purred. I took another step. The wolf launched himself across the space between me and the vampire, fangs aiming for the jugular. No, I screamed, wrenching upright out of my bed. My sudden movement caused the headphones to pull the CD player off the bedside table and a clatter to the wooden floor. My light was still on, and I was sitting fully dressed on the bed with my shoes on. I glanced, disoriented, at the clock on my dresser. It was 5.30 in the morning. I groaned, fell back, and rolled over onto my face, kicking off my boots. I was too uncomfortable to get anywhere near sleep, though. I rolled back over and unbuttoned my jeans, hanging them off awkwardly as I tried to stay horizontal. I could feel the braid in my hair, an uncomfortable ridge along the back of my skull. I turned onto my side and ripped the rubber band out, quickly combing through the plates with my fingers. I pulled the pillow back over my eyes. It was all of no use, of course. My subconscious had dredged up exactly the images I'd been trying so desperately to avoid. I was going to have to face them now. I sat up and my head spun for a minute as the blood flowed downward. First things first, I thought to myself, happy to put it off as long as possible. I grabbed my bathroom bag. The shower didn't last nearly as long as I hoped it would, though. Even taking the time to blow dry my hair, I was soon out of things to do in the bathroom. Wrapped in a towel, I crossed back to my room. I couldn't tell if Charlie was still asleep or if he had already left. I went to look out my window and the cruiser was gone. Fishing again. I dressed slowly in my most comfy sweats and then made my bed, something I never did. I couldn't put it off any longer. I went to my desk and switched on my old computer. I hated using the internet here. My modem was sadly outdated. My free service substandard. Just dialing up took so long that I decided to go get myself a bowl of cereal while I waited. I ate slowly, chewing each bite with care. When I was done, I washed the bowl and spoon, dried them, and put them away. My feet dragged as I climbed the stairs. I went to my CD player first, picking it off the floor and placing it precisely in the center of the table. I pulled out the headphones and put them away in the desk drawer. Then I turned the same CD on, turning it down to the point where it was background noise. With another sigh, I turned to my computer. Naturally, the screen was covered in pop-up bats. This is so old. It's not that old, but it's kind of old. I sat in my hard folding chair and began closing all the little windows. Eventually, I made it to my favorite search engine. I shot down a few more pop-ups and then typed in one word. Vampire. It took an infuriatingly long time, of course. When the results came up, there was a lot to sift through. Everything from movies and TV shows to role-playing games, underground metal and gothic cosmetic companies. Then I found a promising site, Vampires A through Z. I waited impatiently for it to load, quickly clicking closed each ad that flashed across the screen. Finally, the screen was finished. Simple white background with black text, academic looking. Two quotes greeted me on the home page. This text is so tiny, how the heck am I supposed to read this? Throughout the vast shadowy world of ghosts and demons, there is no figure so terrible, no figure so dreaded and abhorred, yet tight, with such fearful fascination as the vampire, who is himself neither ghost nor demon, but yet demon, but yet who partakes the dark natures and possesses the mysterious and terrible qualities of both. Reverend Montague Summers. If there is in this world a well-attested account, it is that of the vampires, nothing is lacking. Official reports, affidavits of well-known people. Of surgeons, of priests, of magistrates, the judicial proof is most complete, and with all that, who is there who believes in vampires? Ronsu? The rest of the site was an alphabetized listing of all the different myths of vampires held throughout the world. The first I clicked on, the Danak, was a Filipino vampire supposedly responsible for planting taro on the islands long ago. The myth continued that the Danak worked with humans for many years, but the partnership ended one day when a woman cut her finger and the Danak sucked her wound. Enjoying the taste so much, 
and that it drained her body completely of blood. I read carefully through the descriptions, looking for anything that sounded familiar, let alone plausible. It seemed that most vampire myths centered around beautiful women as demons and children as victims. They also seemed like constructs created to explain away the high mortality rates for young children and to give men an excuse for infidelity. Many of the stories involved bodily, bodiless spirits and warnings against improper burials. There wasn't much that sounded like the movies I'd seen, and only a very few like the Hebrew Estri and the Polish Ubier, who were even preoccupied with drinking blood. Only three entries really caught my attention. The Romanian Rakolaki, a powerful undead being who could appear as a beautiful, pale-skinned human. The Slovak Nalapsi, a creature so strong and fast it could massacre an entire village in a single hour after midnight, and one other, the Strigoni Benefici. About this last, there was only one brief sentence. Strigoni Benefici, an Italian vampire said to be on the side of goodness and a mortal enemy of all evil vampires. It was a relief, that one small entry, the one myth among hundreds that claimed the existence of good vampires. Overall, though, there was little that coincided with Jacob's stories or my own observations. I'd made a little catalog in my mind as I'd read and carefully compared it with each myth. Speed, strength, beauty, pale skin, eyes that shift color, and then Jacob's criteria. Blood drinkers, enemies of the werewolf, cold-skinned and immortal. There were very few myths that matched even one factor. And then another problem. One that I'd remembered from the small number of scary movies that I'd seen and was backed up by today's reading. Vampires couldn't come out in the daytime. The sun would burn them to a cinder. They slept in coffins all day and came out only at night. Aggravated, I snapped off the computer's main power switch, not waiting to shut things down properly. Through my irritation, I felt overwhelming embarrassment. I was also stupid. I was sitting in my room, researching vampires. What was wrong with me? I decided that most of the blame belonged on the doorstep of the town of Forks, and the entire sodden Olympic Peninsula for that matter. I had to get out of the house, but there was nowhere I wanted to go that didn't involve a three-day drive. I pulled on my boots anyway and clear where I was headed and went downstairs. I shrugged into my raincoat without checking the weather and stomped out the door. It was overcast, but not raining yet. I ignored my truck and started east on foot, angling across Charlie's yard toward the ever-enroaching forest. Encroaching. <laughs> it didn't take long till I was deep enough for the house and the road to be invisible. For the only sound to be the squish of the damp earth under my feet and the sudden cries of the jays. There was a thin ribbon of a trail that led through the forest here, or I wouldn't risk wandering on my own like this. My sense of direction was hopeless. I could get lost in much less helpful surroundings. The trail wound deeper and deeper into the forest, mostly east, as far as I could tell. It snaked around the Sitka spruces and the hemlocks, the yews and the maples. I only vaguely knew the names of the trees around me, and all I knew was due to Charlie pointing them out to me from the cruiser window in earlier days. There were many I didn't know, and others I couldn't be sure about because they were so covered in green parasites. I followed the trail as long as my anger at myself pushed me forward. As that started to ebb, I slowed. A few drops of moisture trickled down from the canopy above me, but I couldn't be certain if it was beginning to rain or if it was simply pools left over from yesterday, held high in the leaves above me, slowly tripping their way back to the earth. A recently fallen tree, I knew it was reason because it wasn't entirely carpeted in moss, rested against the trunk of one of our sisters, creating a sheltered little bench just a few safe feet off the trail. I stepped over the ferns and sat carefully, making sure my jacket was between the damp seat and my clothes wherever they touched, and leaned my hooded head back against the living tree. This was the wrong place to have come. I should have known, but where else was there to go? The forest was deep green and far too much like the scene in last night's dream to allow for peace of mind. Now that there was no longer the sound of my soggy footsteps, the silence was piercing. The birds were quiet too. The drops increasing in frequency, so it must be raining above. The fern stood higher than my head, now that I was seated, and I knew someone could walk on, could walk by on the path, three feet away, and not see me. Here in the trees, it was much easier to believe the absurdities that embarrassed me indoors. 
nothing had changed in this forest for thousands of years, and all the myths and legends of a hundred different lands seemed much more likely in this green haze than they had in my clear-cut bedroom. I forced myself to focus on the two most vital questions I had to answer, but I did so unwillingly. First, I had to decide if it was possible that what Jacob had said about the Cullens could be true. Immediately, my mind responded with a resounding negative. It was silly and morbid to entertain such ridiculous notions, but what then? I asked myself. There was no rational explanation for how I was alive at this moment. I listed again in my head the things I'd observed myself, the impossible speed and strength, the eye color shifting from black to gold and back again, the inhuman beauty, the pale, frigid skin, and more small things that registered slowly, how they never seemed to eat, the disturbing grace with which they moved, and the way he sometimes spoke with unfamiliar cadences and phrases that better fit the style of a turn-of-the-century novel than that of a 21st century classroom. He had skipped class the day we'd done blood typing. He hadn't said no to the beach trip till he heard where we were going. He seemed to know what everyone around him was thinking, except me. He had told me he was the villain. Dangerous. Could the Collins be vampires? Well, there were something. Something outside the possibility of rational justification was taking place in front of my incredulous eyes. Whether it be Jacob's cold ones or my own superhero theory, Edward Cullen was not human. He was something more. And that's the thing, isn't it? She says he was something more, and in his eyes, being a vampire or anything other than human means he's less than... So then, maybe. That would have to be my answer for now. And then the most important question of all. What was I going to do if it was true? If Edward was a vampire, I could hardly make myself think the words. Then what should I do? Involving someone else was definitely out. I couldn't even believe myself. Anyone I told would have me committed. Only two options seemed practical. The first was to take his advice, to be smart, to avoid him as much as possible, to cancel our plans to go back to ignoring him as far as I was able, to pretend there was an impenetrably thick glass wall between us in the one class where we were forced together, to tell him to leave me alone and mean it this time. I was gripped in a sudden agony of despair as I considered that alternative. My mind rejected the pain, quickly skipping on to the next option. I could do nothing different. After all, if he was something sinister, he'd done nothing to hurt me so far. In fact, I would be a dent in Tyler's fender if he hadn't acted so quickly. So quickly, I argued with myself, that it might have been sheer reflexes. But if it was a reflex to save lives, how bad could he be? I retorted. My head spun around in answerless circles. There was one thing I was sure of, if I was sure of anything. The dark Edward in my dream last night was a reflection only of my fear of the word Jacob had spoken, and not at Edward, not Edward himself. Even so, when I screamed down in terror at the werewolf's lunge, it wasn't fear for the, wo for the wolf that brought the cry of no to my lips. It was fear that he would be harmed, even as he called to me with sharp-edged fangs. I feared for him, and I knew, in that, I had my answer. I didn't know if there was ever a choice, really. I was already in too deep. Now that I knew, if I knew, I could do nothing about my frightening secret, because when I thought of him, of his voice, his hypnotic eyes, the magnetic force of his personality, I wanted nothing more than to be with him right now. Even if. But I couldn't think it. Not here, alone in the darkening forest. Not while the rain made it dim as twilight under the canopy and pattered like footsteps across the matted earthen floor. I shivered and rose quickly from my place of concealment. Worried that somehow the path would have disappeared with the rain. But it was there, safe and clear, finding its way out of the dripping green maze. I followed it hastily, my hood pulled close around my face becoming surprised as I nearly ran through the trees at Faro. At how, f at how far I had come, 
I started to wonder if I was heading out at all, or following the path further into the confines of the forest. Before I could get too panicky, though, I began to glimpse some open spaces through the webbed branches, and then I could hear a car passing on the street, and I was free. Charlie saw him stretched down in front of me, the house beckoning me, promising warmth and dry socks. It was just noon when I got back inside. I went upstairs and got dressed for the day, jeans and a t-shirt since I was staying indoors. It didn't take too much effort to concentrate on my task for the day, a paper on Macbeth that was due Wednesday. I settled into outlining a rough draft contently, more serene than I'd felt since, well, since Thursday afternoon, if I was being honest. That always been my way, though. Making decisions was the painful part for me, the part I agonized over. But once the decision was made, I simply followed through, usually with relief that the choice was made. Sometimes the relief was tainted by despair, like my decision to come to Forks, but it was so better than wrestling with the alternatives. I agree. This decision was ridiculously easy to live with. Dangerously easy. And so the day was quiet, productive. I finished my paper before 8. Charlie came home with a large catch and I made a mental note to pick up a book of recipes for fish while I was in Seattle next week. The chills that flashed up my spine whenever I thought of that trip were no different than the ones I'd felt before I'd taken my walk with Jacob Black. They should be different, I thought. I should be afraid. I knew I should. But I couldn't feel the right kind of fear. I slept dreamlessly that night, exhausted from beginning my day so early and sleeping so poorly the night before. I woke, for the second time since arriving in Forks, to the bright yellow light of a sunny day. I skipped to the window, stunned to see that there was hardly a cloud in the sky, and those there were just fleecy little white puffs that couldn't possibly be carrying any rain. I opened the window, surprised when it opened silently, without sticking, not having opened it in who knows how many years, and sucked in the relatively dry air, because <laughs> he oiled it. <laughs> That's kind of weird. <laughs> That's the first time I've actually been bothered by that. I just, maybe you read, maybe it's a, a voting on self-report. <laughs> can I say? It was nearly warm and hardly windy at all. My blood was electric in my veins. Charlie was finishing breakfast when I came downstairs, and he picked up on my mood immediately. Nice day out, he commented. Yes, I agreed with a grin. He smiled back, his brown eyes crinkling around the edges. When Charlie smiled, it was easier to see why he and my mother had jumped too quickly into an early marriage. Most of the young romantic he'd been in those days had faded before I'd known him, as the curly brown hair, the same color if not the same texture as mine, had dwindled, slowly revealing more and more of the shiny skin of his forehead. But when he smiled, I could see a little of the man who had run away with Renee when she was just two years older than I was now. I ate breakfast cheerily, watching the dust motes stirring in the sunlight that streamed in the back window. Charlie called out a goodbye, and I heard the cruiser pull away from the house. I hesitated on my way out the door, hand on my rain jacket. It would be tempting fate to leave it home. With a sigh, I folded it over my arm and stepped out into the brightest light I'd seen in months. By dint of much elbow grease, I was able to get both windows in the truck almost completely rolled down. I was one of the first ones to school. I hadn't even checked the clock in my hurry to get outside. I parked and headed toward the seldom used picnic benches on the south side of the cafeteria. The benches were still a little damp, so I sat on my jacket, glad to have a use for it. My homework was done, the product of a slow social life. But there were a few trick problems I wasn't sure I had right. I took out my book industriously, but halfway through rechecking the first problem, I was daydreaming, watching the sunlight play on the red bark trees. I sketched inattentively along the margins of my homework. After a few minutes, I suddenly realized I'd drawn five pairs of dark eyes staring out of the page at me. I scrubbed them out with a eraser. Bella! I heard someone call, and it sounded like Mike. I looked around to realize that the school had become populated while I'd been sitting there, absent-minded. Everyone was in t-shirts, some even in shorts, though the temperature couldn't be over 60. Actually, 60 isn't that bad. Mike was coming toward me in cocky shorts and a striped rugby shirt, waving. Hey, Mike. I called, waving back, unable to be half-hearted half on a morning like this. 
He came to sit by me, the tidy spikes of his hair shining golden in the light, his grin stretching across his face. He was so delighted to see me, I couldn't help but feel gratified. I never noticed before. Your hair has red in it, he commented, catching between his fingers a strand that was fluttering in the light breeze. Only in the sun. I became just a little uncomfortable as he tucked the lock behind my ear. Great day, isn't it? My kind of day, I agreed. What did you do yesterday? His son was just a bit too propriety, too proprietary. I promise I can read. <laughs> I mostly worked on my essay. I didn't add that I was finished with it. I need to sound smug. He hit his forehead with the heel of his hand. Oh, yeah, that's due Thursday, right? Um, Wednesday, I think. Wednesday? He frowned. That's not good. What are you writing yours on? Whether Shakespeare's treatment of the female characters is misogynistic. I, he stared at me like I'd just spoken in pig Latin. I guess I'll have to get to work on that tonight, he said, deflated. I was going to ask if you wanted to go out. Oh, I was taken off guard. Why can't I ever have a pleasant conversation with Mike anymore without it getting awkward? Well, we could go to dinner or something, and I could work on it later, he smiled at me hopefully. Mike, I hate it being put on the spot. I don't think that would be the best idea. His face fell. Why? Why? He asked, his eyes guarded. My thoughts flickered to Edward, wondering if that's where his thoughts were as well. I think, and if you ever repeat what I'm saying right now, I will cheerfully beat you to death, I threatened, but I think that would hurt Jessica's feelings. He was bewildered, obviously not thinking in that direction at all. Jessica? Really, Mike, are you blind? Oh, he exhaled, clearly dazed. I took advantage of that to make my escape. It's time for class, and I can't be late again. I gathered my books up and stuffed them in my bag. We walked in silence to building three, and his expression was distracted. I hoped whatever thoughts he was immersed in were leading him in the right direction. Someone like that. When I saw Jessica and Trey, she was bubbling with enthusiasm. She, Angela, and Lauren were going to Port Angeles tonight to go dress shopping for the dance, and she wanted me to come too, even though I didn't need one. I was indecisive. It would be nice to get out of town with some girlfriends, but Lauren would be there, and who knew what I could be doing tonight. But that was definitely the wrong path to let my mind wander down. Of course, I was happy about the sunlight, but I wasn't completely responsible for the euphoric mood I was in. Not even close. So I give her a maybe, telling her I'd have to talk with Charlie first. She talked of nothing but the dance on the way to Spanish, continuing as if without an as if without an interruption when class finally ended. Five minutes late, and we were on our way to lunch. I was far too lost in my own frenzy of anticipation to notice much of what she said. I was painfully eager to see not just him but all the Collins, to compare them with the new suspicions that plagued my mind. As I crossed the threshold of the cafeteria, I felt the first true tingle of fear slither down my spine and settle in my stomach. Would they be able to know what I was thinking? And then a different feeling jolted through me. Would Edward be waiting to sit with me again? As was my routine, I glanced first toward the Cullen's table. A shiver of panic trembled in my stomach as I realized it was empty. The dwindling hope. My eyes scoured the rest of the cafeteria hoping to find him alone, waiting for me. The place was nearly filled, Spanish had made us late, but there was no sign of Edward or any of his family. Desolation hit me with crippling strength. I shambled along behind Jessica, who uses the word shambled, not bothering to pretend to listen anymore. We were late enough that everyone had already, we were late enough that everyone was already at our table. I avoided the empty chair next to Mike in favor of one by Angela. I vaguely noticed that Mike held the chair out politely for Jessica and that her face lit up in response. Angela asked a few quiet questions about the Macbeth paper, Macbeth? Macbeth? which I answered as naturally as I could while spiraling downward in misery. She too invited me to go with him tonight, and I agreed now, grasping at anything to distract myself. I realized I'd been holding on to a last shred of hope when I entered biology, saw his empty seat, and felt a new wave of disappointment.
The rest of the day passed slowly, dismally. In gym, we had a lecture on the rules of badminton, the next torture they had lined up for me. But at least it meant I got to sit and listen instead of stumbling around on the court. The best part was the coach didn't finish, so I got another day off tomorrow. Never mind that the day after they would arm me with a racket before unleashing me on the rest of the class. I was glad to leave campus, so I would be free to pout and move before I went out tonight with Jessica and company. But right after I walked into the door of Charlie's house, Jessica called to cancel our plans. You know what I really want to see? Um, when she stops calling at Charlie's house, that'll be interesting. And she calls it home. But right after I walked in the door of Charlie's house, Jessica called to cancel our plans. I tried to be happy that Mike had asked her out to dinner. I really was relieved that he finally seemed to be catching on, but my enthusiasm sounded false in my own ears. She rescheduled our shopping trip for tomorrow night, which left me with little in the way of distractions. I had fish marinating for dinner, with a salad and bread left over from the night before, so there was nothing to do there. I spent a focused half hour on homework, but then I was through with that, too. I checked my email, reading the backlog of letters from my mother, getting snippier as they progressed to the present, and I sighed and typed a quick response. Mom, sorry I've been out. I went to the beach with some friends, and I had to write a paper. My excuses were fairly pathetic, so I gave up on that. It's sunny outside today. I know, I'm shocked too. So I'm going to go outside and soak up as much vitamin D as I can. I love you, Bella. I decided to kill an hour with non-school related reading. I had a small collection of books that came with me to Forks, the shabbiest volume being a compilation of the works of Jane Austen. I selected that one and headed to the backyard, grabbing a ragged old quilt from the linen cupboard at the top of the stairs on my way down. Outside in Charlie's small square yard, I folded the quilt in half and laid it out of the reach of the tree's shadows on the thick lawn that would always be slightly wet, no matter how long the sun shone. I lay on my stomach, crossing my ankles in the air, flipping through the different novels in the book, trying to decide which one would occupy my mind the most thoroughly. My favorites were Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility. I'd read the first most recently, so I started into Sense and Sensibility, only to remember, after I began Chapter 3, that the hero of the story happened to be named Edward. Angrily, I turned to Mansfield Park, but the hero of that piece was named Edmund, and that was just too close. Weren't there any other names available in the late 18th century? I snapped the book shut, annoyed, and rolled over onto my back. I pushed my sleeves up as high as they would go and closed my eyes. I would think of nothing but the warmth on my skin, I told myself severely. The breeze was still light, but it blew tendrils of my hair around my face, and that tickled a bit. I pulled all my hair over my head, letting it found out on the cold above me, and focused again on the heat that touched my eyelids, my cheekbones, my nose, my lips, my forearms, my neck, soaked through my light shirt. The next thing I was conscious of was the sound of Charlie's cruiser turning onto the brakes of the driveway. I sat up in surprise, realizing the light was gone behind the trees, and I had fallen asleep. I looked around, muddled, with a sudden feeling that I wasn't alone. Charlie? I asked, but I could hear his door slamming in front of the house. I jumped up, foolishly edgy, gathering the now damp quilt in my book. I ran inside to get some oil heating on the stove, realizing that dinner would be late. Charlie was hanging up his gun belt and stepping out of his boots when I came in. Sorry, Dad. Dinner's not ready yet. I fell asleep outside. I stifled a yawn. Don't worry about it, he said. I wanted to catch the score on the game anyway. I watched TV with Charlie after dinner for something to do. There wasn't anything I wanted to watch, but he knew I didn't like baseball so he turned it to some mindless sitcom that neither of us enjoyed. He seemed happy, though, to be doing something together, and it felt good, despite my depression, to make him happy. Dad, I said during a commercial, Jessica and Angela are going to look at dresses for the dance tomorrow night in Port Angeles, and they wanted me to help them choose. Do you mind if I go with them? Jessica Stanley? he asked. And Angela Weber, I sighed as I gave him the details. He was confused. But you're not going to the dance, right? No, Dad, but I'm helping them find dresses. 
you know, giving them constructive criticism. I wouldn't have to explain this to a woman. Well, okay. He seemed to realize that he was out of his depth with the girly stuff. It's a school night, though. We'll leave right after school so we can get back early. You'll be okay for dinner, right? Bells, I fed myself for 17 years before you got here. He reminded me. I don't know how you survived, I muttered, then added more clearly. I'll leave some things for cold cut sandwiches in the fridge, okay? Right on top. It was sunny again in the morning. I awakened with renewed hope that I grimly tried to suppress. I dressed for the warmer weather in a deep blue v-neck blouse, something I'd worn in the dead of winter in Phoenix. I had planned my arrival at school, at school so that I barely had time to make it to class. With a sinking heart, I circled the full lot looking for a space while also searching for the silver Volvo that was clearly not there. I parked in the last row and hurried to English, arriving breathless but subdued before the bi final bell. It was the same as yesterday. I just couldn't keep little sprouts of hope from budding in my mind, only to have them squished painfully as I searched the lunchroom to vain, in vain and sat at my empty biology table. The poor Angela scheme was back on again for tonight and made all the more attractive by the fact that Lauren had all their obligations. I was anxious to get out of town so I could stop glancing over my shoulder, hoping to see him appearing out of the blue the way he always did. I vowed to myself that I would be in a good mood tonight and not ruin Angela's or Jessica's enjoyment in the dress hunting. Maybe I could do a little clothes shopping as well. I refused to think that I might be shopping alone in Seattle this weekend, no longer interested in the earlier arrangement. Surely he wouldn't cancel without at least telling me. After school, Jessica followed me home in her old white Mercury so that I could ditch my books and truck. I brushed through my hair quickly when I was inside, feeling a slight lift of excitement as I contemplated getting out of forks. I left a note for Charlie on the table, explaining again where to find dinner switched my scruffy wallet from my school bag to a purse I really used, and ran out to try and Jessica. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna go out. I don't have friends. We went to Angela's house next, and she was waiting for us. My excitement increased exponentially as we actually drove out, drove out of the town limits. Yay. The bookmark. And that is it. My throat is killing me. <laughs> I wanted to record more than one, but that won't be um, possible. What will be possible is that I edit this tomorrow afternoon and have it uploaded tomorrow night. So I'll be seeing you soon. Well, for you, it's obviously an hour, but, um, this whole video thing is, you know, somewhat similar to time travel. Consider subscribing if you want to keep reading with me. Uh, let me know down in the comments below any books. Um, mostly mainstream is kind of what I'm looking for, right? So any mainstream books that you might be interested. Uh, I have a couple. I have a small list that I'm probably going to get to at some point. Um, and I'm looking to make other kinds of ASMR videos as well. Please check the description box for some important information. I mean, I want to... I kind of want to do like a little watch, what do you call it, like a watch party? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what you call it. <laughs> I kind of want to do a little watch party um, at the end of like each book where you watch the movie. So uh, if you guys are down for that, then let me know and we'd, um, we would do that in Discord. So there is a server set up already uh, down below you can join, but with that, I will leave you to rest. Once again, thank you so much for joining me. It is such a pleasure, and I'm excited to actually finish the whole saga this time. Um, take care of yourself. Drink some water. Okay. Eat more than one time a day, and I promise to also do the same starting tomorrow. Read a good book. You don't have to read with me. It's okay. I forgive you. Watch something.
Do you guys like that it's an actual book? Because it's heavy. <laughs> Would you mind if I, like, use the tablet or, like, my phone? I mean, I can't use my phone. I'm recording. Damn. Like a tablet or maybe even, like, my computer. What are you guys the guns? And I, like, have to rest my arms on the table and it's just, it's just still uncomfortable of the sharp edge. <laughs>